Final Fantasy IX is the ninth main installment in the franchise, and the third and last one for the PlayStation, making it the end of that particular era. After the sci-fi steampunk style of Final Fantasy VII and VIII, IX is a return to the classic series roots, making it into a medieval fantasy setting with the desire of creating a world that the child may dream up, but also with things like the class distribution per characters, instead of that make your own class style that Materia and GFs could do. With that in mind, it is considered like a love letter to the franchise that brought many unforgettable adventures to a lot of us, something you can already tell by just looking at the details in the game, from the atmosphere it provides to the gameplay features that make this game entertaining and enjoyable. One thing that these games tend to do, which I really like, is to make the iconic monsters, spells, weapon or even character name appear through most of the installments, giving some sort of identity to them, but still keeping their individuality as a standalone game for each release, constantly changing some mechanics to make that experience unique from game to game. So to make a video about references in Final Fantasy IX would sound redundant, but what I want to focus on is not these shared elements of every game but rather the callbacks and references that 9 makes to the other releases specifically. That makes it so special. So I won't be including the things you can imagine when talking about Final Fantasy, like chocobos, bombs, classes, spells, summons, or the fact that there is going to be a guy called Sid. Of course there are still general references through the game, and you can see that in the aesthetics already, like seeing Vivi character design inspired by the iconic black mage sprite while the white mage sprite is seen with the robe that Garnet or Dagger is using when you first meet her. These two characters also represent the classes in their gameplay too, as you would expect. So let's start with all these allusions that Final Fantasy IX makes to previous games. I probably should make a disclaimer here, that of course I'm going to talk about Final Fantasy IX, so you would expect spoilers of the game, but also from previous Final Fantasy games. It's references that covers details out of context, but also key points of the plot. So yeah, be aware of that. Madeleine statue in Alexandria. By the way, we are going to be mostly in chronological order from the introduction up until the very end of disc 4. So when we start the game, we control Vivi in Alexandria. If you go back one screen and interact with the statue there, you'll see a message commemorating a general called Madeleine. This name might be taken from Final Fantasy VI main protagonist Terra's or Tina, mother. Now, if you're confused because Terra's mother name is Madonna, which I find it very funny, that's because that's one of the many quirky translations that exist in that game, while in Japanese she is called Madeleine. Cornelia in I Want to Be Your Canary Final Fantasy IX starts with the theater troupe Tantalus, presenting their play in Alexandria, with the sacred mission of stealing their princess Garnet during it. The play is called I Want to Be Your Canary, which is in its way a big Shakespeare reference, and one of its characters is Princess Cornelia. Cornelia is the very first city you visit in the original Final Fantasy, as you spawn next to it at the start of the game, just like how Alexandria is the first city here. In a similar fashion, in the Japanese version, Paku mentioned that the other character, Prince Schneider, is from the Sassoon country, which is its location in Final Fantasy III. Gilgamesh Appearance I know I said that I won't be mentioning references that are in numerous entries, but this one is special. When you think of Gilgamesh in Final Fantasy, you think of the same swordsman that travels through dimensions and lands in most games collecting swords, very iconic swords. But in Final Fantasy IX, the character name Gilgamesh is not revealed until later, and is introduced to you as Alleyway Jack, a four-armed treasure hunter that appears in Alexandria, Treno and Daguerreo, mostly stealing you but also teaching you how to play cards, and will reveal his true name if you get a high ranking later in the game. Gilgamesh was introduced first in Final Fantasy V as a recurring antagonist that ended up befriending you, an optional GF in Final Fantasy VIII and in later entries. You can also find a letter from Enkido mentioning Excalibur, both a character and a weapon respectively, from Final Fantasy V. Rufus' welcoming ceremony in the Evil Forest. By that, I mean the title of the song, played by the orchestra that you can listen to during an active time event, as there's also musical references in this game. As a Final Fantasy VII fan, I was very happy when I first heard this. 
This song is indeed from that game, and as you can predict from its name, it plays when Junon receives the new Shinra president, Rufus Shinra, in their city, while you dress up as a grunt and join the parade. Ketchi Fortune in Dali When resting at the inn at the village of Dali, you can interact with an item that will give you a good omen and fortune. Now, that's something very common to have, but the way the last text shows your lucky color for today is white, is reminiscent of when you first meet Ketchi in Final Fantasy VII, and while giving you your fortune, it reads, your lucky color is blue even if you never ask for that type of fortune to begin with. Locke in Lindblom During your first visit to Lindblom, you can talk to an old man whose name is Locke, likely a reference to one of Final Fantasy VI party member Locke Cole, arguably the sexiest man in the franchise, if I have to be objective. Cloud reference in Lindblom's weapon shop Speaking of sexy, if you visit the weapon shop and interact with a bunch of swords that are on the wall, Zidane would say, I remember a guy with spiky hair who carried something like this, in allusion to Cloud Strife, who besides carrying some big swords, he is also called spiky hair in-game. Fabul This name appears on different occasions, mainly because it's the last name of Lindblom's regent, Sid Fabul. The name Fabul alludes to the homonym city or castle in Final Fantasy IV, home of the powerful monks including your party member Yang, and protectors of the Wind Crystal. Palom and Porom one of the shops in Lindblom mentions Polom's action figures. Palom and Porom are the twin mages that help Cecil to become a paladin in Final Fantasy IV, so this is a combination of their names, making it even harder for me to remember them accurately and don't confuse each other. The Trance ability This one is about a mechanic in the gameplay or battle system. Similar to limit breaks in Final Fantasy VII, there's a bar under your ATP that will charge when you get hurt. Once it's filled, you get automatically in trance mode where every character has its own power-ups and different looks, with a pinkish aura. This ability is not just similar looking to Final Fantasy VI's Terra's Morph ability, in which she turns into her Esper form, but rather it is said ability, as Morph in the Japanese version is called, in fact, Trance. Bells as keys in Burmesia, a minimum mention. When you enter Gizamaluk Grotto, to make it on time to Burmesia that is being attacked, a fallen soldier will give you a bell that will serve you as the key to open the doors. This is a similar concept to the way you enter Karshan Keep in Final Fantasy II. If that sounds too generic of a concept, one of these specific bells in its description will be signed by Philosopher Minu, referencing Minu from Final Fantasy II, the powerful white mage who aids you in the game from the very start and will help you get Ultima. Altair and Vega in Southgate if you talk to one of my favorite NPCs named ever, Jobless Chef, in Southgate, he'll mention that he has a shop called Altair that you can visit later. Altair by itself is the name of the home base of the Resistance in Final Fantasy II, your starting point, but there's more than that, as Altair is the name of a star and one half of the Japanese festival called Tanabata, the Star Festival. The other one is called Vega. These two represent two lovers who were placed in the sky as stars, yet they can be together as the Celestial River or the Milky Way separated them, only meeting once a year on the seventh day of the seventh month of the year. I'm sure you've seen these names or concepts being represented in many Japanese games, for example to get an idea of this starry sky, when Cloud and Tifa made a promise under the stars, you can see in the sky this Milky Way in a very nice detail when the camera tilts up, and Altera and Vega are two stars that are on opposite sides. I find it very funny that Final Fantasy IX made this romantic tale about two item shops of all things, separated by the mountains. Burmesia and Soso similarities Towns in Final Fantasy and most RPG games tend to be your resting stops, the place where you can rest and prepare for what's ahead. In Burmesia's case, as the town is attacked, you see it in ruins and with the probability to engage in random battles as any other dungeon, and some fixed story battles. It's also known as the city where the rain doesn't stop. These things are shared characteristics with the town Soso in Final Fantasy VI, as when you enter, it be constantly raining, populated by thieves mainly, which would make it be filled with random encounters, instead of your average nice relaxing shelters. Alexandria and Varon similarities In this case, it's more complex than just similar layouts or shared features. It's more about the whole structure that these kingdoms and the rulers have, and it's a pretty interesting one. 
At this point of the game, we are approaching the end of disc 1, and for that we have our first real meeting with General Beatrix of Alexandria and the mysterious Kuja who approaches Queen Bran of Alexandria and are currently invading Burmesia with their Black Mage army. And there's a lot of parallels that we can make of these characters and its kingdom structure with Final Fantasy IV. In Final Fantasy IV, you start as Captain Cecil of Paron, after invading the city of Mysidia to get one of the crystals. You can make the comparison between Queen Bran and the King of Paron. He was once a benevolent ruler who took the children Cecil and Cain and raised them as his own, but there's a sudden change in his decisions, when he starts commanding this invasion to retrieve the crystals. Just like how Queen Bran is also a loved ruler who adopted the child as hers and is now Princess Carnet, also known as Dagger. But this first section of the game you start seeing questionable decisions, like invading Burmesia here. Both kingdoms have on their lines two of the most powerful generals leading their army, a very similar army also. These are the paladins Beatrix of Alexandria and Cecil Harvey from Baron, initially a Dark Knight. Not only that, but these two characters start realizing the sudden change in the rulers and eventually go against them, in their own way. And finally, you see that the reason for their sudden change is because there is a second mastermind behind them, either controlling or convincing the king and queen for their own benefit. These characters are the game's main antagonist, Kuja and Golbez. So, as you can see, there's a similar relationship in both games and kingdoms. Treno and Gidor. Back to back to back cities parallels. This one is again about some shared features. Treno is considered a city of nobles. You can find a lot of eccentric things here, like a card game stadium, an item shop with monsters to challenge, and more important, an auction house to get random items. But not only that, this city has a distinguished difference between the upper sector and the slums, home of some thugs and making clear the difference between the rich and the poor. The city of Jidor in Final Fantasy VI shares some of these characteristics, as it has its own action house, and the novels around mention how you should take care about anyone from Soso, the city below, that will come up and mug you. Mune and Doga through the game. Speaking of auction houses, two of the items that you can get in here are called Unes Mirror and Doga's Artifact. These names belong to the Final Fantasy III support characters Une and Doga, powerful magicians who aids you in the game. This is not the only place you'll see these names, as you can find some inscriptions signed by Une de Mol in Mount Gul. Or even more interesting, if you take these two artifacts to the Black Mage Village during Disc 4, you'll trigger a cutscene, where the music theme will start playing. The Ant-Lion boss fight The Ant-Lion is a monster creature that doesn't feature only in one game. You may have seen the enemy in another game like Final Fantasy V or XII, but the reference here is specific to Final Fantasy IV Ant-Lion. That's because both creatures are initially considered tame and that they don't attack people, despite its looks, according to Edward. But they go on a rampage still, emerging from the sand, attacking a prince, Edward and Prince Puck, before the boss fight starts. Klim Hazard. In your fights against Beatrix, at the end she'll deal a powerful blow that will leave your party members to 1 HP, ending the fight in a loss. This attack is called Klim Hazard, and it's a reference to one of Cloud Strife's limit breaks of the same name. You can even get this attack later on. There's also one of Zidane's ability called Lucky 7, that is from Final Fantasy 7, but you know, the idea of 7 being lucky in slots is something very common. Joseph's Story. This one is really cool, and more on your nose than you'd expect. When meeting Ramu at the Pinnacle Rocks, he'll ask you to get five parts of his tail, and put it in order, choosing the appropriate ending out of two options. The rest of the story goes like this. Once upon a time, 33 small countries fought together against an empire. One day, a rebel troop visited a man named Joseph, who lived with his daughter. 
Owing a debt to the troop, he gladly accepted their plea for help. They headed for a cavern in the snowfields. With Joseph's help, the troop defeated the Adamantoids in the snowfields cavern and acquired the goddess bell that they needed to enter the Empire's castle. Hey, we talked about that bell earlier. On their way home, they fell into a trap set by a traitor. Joseph gave his life to save the troop. The troop left without telling Joseph's daughter Nelly about the tragedy. And the two possible endings talk about the explanations of them not talking to Nelly about it and such. This is exactly what happens in Final Fantasy II, when the monk Joseph, with an F, joins you and at the end of the dungeon you get intercepted by the pirate traitor Borgen, and in his death he activates his trap card, with Joseph sacrificing himself to save the crew from the falling rock. A very common thing to most temporal party members there, by the way. Even his daughter's name is Nelly. It's such a direct reference and I loved it. Eidolons and Mashiside. Summons are pretty common in Final Fantasy and one of the most iconic things. They can go by many names, such as Aeons, Espers, Primals, or in this case, Eidolons. And the way to get these summons in action is very similar to Final Fantasy VI, through beautiful stones that you equip and grant you the ability to summon them. While in Final Fantasy VI, that's how you are able to use them and learn abilities, equipping what is called Magicide, and release the potential of the Espers. Also, both times it's Ramu, the one who introduces you this for the first time. I guess the wise old man is the best choice for these type of things. Lally Ho. Arriving to Compete, you'll be received by a new race, the Dwarves. This is one of the most famous and iconic races in any fantasy-like type of media, and in this game, although different looking, they will introduce to you with their greeting, Rally Ho, even not letting you in until you respond the same way. This one is the same as the Dwarves you meet in Final Fantasy IV and III, Lally Ho. Although a little bit different in aesthetics and location, still keeping the traditional greeting. Mog's importance and Maduin. There's a lot of Moogles in Final Fantasy IX. They serve you as a safe point, shop, and mail delivery. But there's one that stands out the most. It's the one closest to the little girl you met from the summoner's village, Eiko. And its name is Mog. The same as the most important Moogle in Final Fantasy VI, that you can even have as a party member and make it a dragoon if you want to. But there's even more than just that. Later in the game, Mog intercepts when Kuja wants to remove Eiko's Eidolons from her, giving itself as a new summon to fight, and asks you to use the attack Terra Homing. During that animation, we can see how the Eidolon look, and it's probably not what you expect out of a Moogle. When we check the ribbon that allows you to use the summon, you see that the name is Madin. Terra's father in Final Fantasy VI is indeed Maduin, although written differently in English, they share the same name. A similar situation with Terra's mother's name, funny enough. Eiko and Rydia. Speaking of Eiko, you can make some connection between her and Rydia from Final Fantasy IV, as they share some attributes. They are both very young girls when they can join the party. They are from a villager of summoners whose life revolves around it, that was destroyed by the main antagonist in some way or another, making them the sole known survivor. And can perform white magic and summon, of course. At this point in the game, we are reaching the end of Disc 2. The crystals that Queen Bran were looking for while invading several towns are finally collected, and her lust for power grew even further. When the Black Mage army defect and leave with Kuja, she sets out to hunt him down, with the power of the most powerful Eidolon at her disposal now. The Queen and her army met Kuja at the coast of the Ifa tree, and she uses the newly acquired Garnet Crystal to summon the King Dragon Bahamut, a staple of the series. Kuja handles the situation without any worries, as he reveals his secret weapon. A mysterious big red eye appears in the sky, and instead of destroying Alexandria's army, it had the power to enslave Bahamut itself, and uses it to annihilate Queen Bran and her troops, with a big mega flare, a very scary sight. After that, we can see that the party runs to Bran's last breathing moments, as she dies regretful of the path she took on, motivated by greed and that lust of power, after her husband died. I have to admit, if someone wants to make the death of a total evil character emotional, I think this is one perfect example. 
With Garnet or Dagger having her last farewell to her adopted mother, she goes back to Alexandria, where, escorted by General Beatrix and Steiner, becomes the new queen. The Invincible Ship The first day as Queen of Alexandria is a rough one for Dagger. As Kuja invades the city with his newly acquired Bahamut, Dagger, thanks to Eiko, is able to summon the Aetolon protector of the city, Alexander, and defend the city, but once again Kuja summons that ominous red eye in the sky, revealing to be an airship called the Invincible. This name is shared with the ultimate ship in Final Fantasy III, the last one you can get. Garland Appearance when calling upon the Invincible, there's another plot revelation that surprised even Kuja for the first time in the game. Inside the ship, you'll see an evil-looking man whose name is Garland, tracing his own plot. The name Garland will surely ring a bell, as he's the very first enemy you face in the original Final Fantasy. Quoting Sakaguchi here, Garland, who was defeated at the beginning of the story, reincarnated as Chaos 2000 years ago, continued his reign of darkness and then became a warrior of light again and so on in an infinite loop. He is that Garland, and someone that I'm sure you'll see in the future very soon. The Tantarian Enemy While exploring Alexandria Library, you have the option to fight a specific enemy. It is a book, of course, why wouldn't it be? But the cool thing here is the different monsters that you see on it, as they all represent enemies in Final Fantasy V. On the side, you can see a demonic looking monster that is page 32. The blue head that pops out out of the book is page 64. The spider on the back is page 128. And the mask on the cover is page 256. If you're wondering why they have those names, it is because they are all part of the same battle where, as you knock them down, new pages will appear. The Twin Moons. While exploring Oilbert, you learn the lore of the world, how our Gaia and the planet Terra were once one and had two moons, one blue and one red. This is reminiscent of Final Fantasy IV, whose world has two moons and one of them is called the Red Moon that you can go to and where the Lunarian race is from, quite important in the plot. The Warring Triad Statues This is a very cool reference that you find in the Desert Palace owned by Kusha. You'll see that the entrance has three statues, two demonic ones on the sides and one that resembles an angel in the middle. You can read the inscriptions as Promise of Evil God, Truth of the Devil and Illusion of the Goddess, respectively. These are a callback to Final Fantasy VI Warring Triad statues, known as the gods and creator of magic that Kefka conquered and allowed him to turn the world into a world of ruin. You can later fight them, and these are called the Demon, known as Poltergeist in the English translation, Goddess, whose name is accurate this time, and Fiend, known as Doom in the English translation, or Evil God if you want to. By the way, I'm in love with that design for boss battles. I jokingly say that my favorite Final Fantasy type of enemy are the complex statues filled with faces like the Final Fantasy VI last boss, for example, before Kefka or Neonic's death. Tetra Master Cards Tetra Master is the card game that serves as the main minigame of this Final Fantasy, one I really enjoy, honestly, so you would expect a bunch of easter eggs here. The cards are mostly monsters of the game, but if you explore Kucha's room in the palace, you can find the card naming way and to see not only that he sounds similar to the character that allows you to name your character in Final Fantasy IV, but also the card itself has the sprite. Other cards like these are Boko, the known Chocobo pet of Final Fantasy V main protagonist, the two moons that mentioned before that we can relate to Final Fantasy IV, and the sprite of an airship, which is the same as the airship you fly in Final Fantasy V. Mount Gulug Mount Gulug is a place in the Lost Continent that is directly linked to a location in Final Fantasy 1. Even if the name there is Mount Gulg, their Japanese name is the same and it's Gurugu Kasan or Gulug Volcano. As you can see by the world map and the layout, the place is filled with lava and clearly representing a volcano, and even host of the Fire Fiend boss. But more on that later. Hilda 
After hearing the name a handful of times, you get to meet Hilda, the wife of Regent Sid and the inspiration of every airship name, the Hilda Guard. Hilda is the name of another princess in Final Fantasy, and she is the princess of Finn that aids you from the start after the Emperor conquered almost everything there is to conquer in Final Fantasy II. The world map similarities. This one I admit that I've read about it in the past, but I'm not fully convinced. The idea is that now that we have the airship at our disposal, we can travel around the world and see the layout of the map that is supposedly also a reference to Final Fantasy 1 world. I mean, maybe? It is certainly the most similar, as it doesn't match any of the others, so probably. The first Final Fantasy is likely the most referenced here, after all. Pandemonium We are reaching the latter stages of the game, so here comes the good stuff. Sidan arrives to Garland's domain inside the planet Terra, Pandemonium. And this one here is a really cool one, not just because the name is homonym to Final Fantasy II Final Dungeon, but the theme played here is a slow version of the same track that plays during the Final Fantasy II Dungeon, which by the way is my favorite theme of any Final Dungeon that there is. Kuja and Kefka. After some heavy stuff, the end of Disc 3 included us fighting against Garland first and later Kuja, who got the power of trance, making him more powerful than the latter, so with that in mind, he decides to eliminate him in a cruel way, having no mercy against his former master, kicking him while he's on the floor and launching him into the abyss. This exact sequence can be seen during the moment where Kefka, controlling the power of the mentioned status, disposed of his emperor Gestal in a similar and cruel fashion as every iconic main antagonist should do. Bobby Corwin After the dramatic moments, we need some wholesomeness, which comes in the form of the independent black mages who refused to follow Koja and took care of a chocobo egg instead. This chick was born and named Bobby Corwin. And yes, I know it sounds very English, but it's the same in Japanese. Taking the first syllables of each name, you form Boko, probably the most famous chocobo in the series after Bobby, as he is the main protagonist pet in Final Fantasy V and appears from the cover up until the very ending. In the middle he even found a partner and already had kids with her, my boy had a whole arc in that game. Gogo In the city of Daguerreo, an old man would ask you to get the magical fingertips, mentioning that it belongs to the famous craftsman named Gogo, as he was famous for making dolls, but you can get a couple of them too. Gogo is a very special character, the first appeared as the famed mimic in Final Fantasy V as an enemy in a challenging dungeon, mentioning that he would mimic everything you do, and eventually after the battle you can get the mime job, but also in Final Fantasy VI you'll find him and he will join the party casting mime constantly. 
There's an ongoing joke that it's the same Gogo in both games, as he threw himself in a time-space warp in 5, and you can find him in 6, after you get eaten by a Zone Eater and thrown to another place completely. That girl's real name. Uh, no, not Garnet. This one may have become my favorite. I've been mentioning Princess Garnet, who also goes by Dagger, as she uses that as her codename to go undercover at the start of the game, but none of them are really her true name. During the game, you learn that Dagger was born in the summoner village Madain Sari, the same as Eiko, and later adopted by Queen Bran, so you would expect her to have another name even if that doesn't come up. The thing is, after a very specific side quest exploring Madain Sari, you'll get access to more inscriptions at the Eidolon Wall, and one of them has a very meaningful message. I have a mortal wound. I won't be able to wait for you very long. I regret being so unemotional for all these years. I'm writing down everything here in the hope that you'll read it someday. To my dearest wife, Jane, although we fought many times, and I might not have shown my affection enough, I love you very much. To my beloved daughter, Sarah, my life changed when you were born. You made me happy. These are the things I want you to know. This very emotional message is written by Dagger's father, or should I say, by Sarah's father. But I use Dagger for less confusion. What's mind-blowing is that Sarah is the original Final Fantasy princess. It's that character you must rescue from Garland at the start of the game and of the series. Also yes, you will see her in action in the near future once more. She is the go-to Final Fantasy princess name, if you will. But something even more incredible than that is that Dagger's father message reveals also the name of her mother, which is Jane. Of course, Jane is the name of the Queen of Cornelia, mother of the Princess Sarah of Cornelia. Simple and amazing detail and even cooler that it's so well hidden. Also, the message is very beautiful and it's even sadder when you learn that Dagger can't read it, because one of the conditions is to not have her in the party, so you don't get to see her reaction to it. Shinryu when approaching the final dungeon, Memoria, you'll get a nice welcome by a boss fight, the Nova Dragon, a test worthy of the end of the game, which is heavily influenced by the Final Fantasy V super boss Shinryu. Now, it looks different to what you may remember from Final Fantasy V and you'll be right, but this is in fact the same dragon, as in both these pictures, they share the same Japanese name. Furthermore, spin-off games like Dissidia or Record Keeper will include both designs as the enemy known as Shinryu. This is one of the many cases where such a reference became common in the franchise since then, as you can see Shinryu in the remastered versions of Final Fantasy 1 and 4, and as well in future games like 10 or 14. Kain's Lance In Memoria, you can find Freya's ultimate weapon. As the Dragoon Knight she is, she got Kain's Lance. Kain is probably one of the most recognizable characters in Final Fantasy, specifically for his design. He's the quintessential Dragoon in the series. As much as I enjoy making fun of him, I'm not blind to see that. Also, the picture of the lance is very similar to Cain's main weapon, and you'll get the achievement Cain's Legacy in the remastered version. This too is an instance where the reference appears in more games later, like how Cain's lance is a weapon in Final Fantasy X and XIII. The Four Fiends of Chaos There are four big bosses in Memoria, all of them are fixed encounters. The first one appears as a woman with the lower body of a snake and six arms wielding each a sword. She will introduce herself as I am one of Chaos Guardians, and indeed she is one of the four fiends of Chaos in Final Fantasy 1, the Fire Fiend to be precise, and the final boss of the volcano or Mount Gulu that we mentioned before. The good thing is that she's not alone, as every fiend of Chaos is present. Your next encounter is the Fiend of Wind, the six-headed dragon Tiamat. The third one introduces itself accurately as the Water Chaos Kraken. By his name alone you can imagine how it looks since the original game. And the final thing we fight is the Earth Chaos Lich, the undead with the appearance of a skeleton. Now, this is not the first time we encounter most of them, as earlier in the game the party splits to activate each one key but you only get to fight the Lich, as the rest have to deal off-screen with that, so it's a pleasant surprise to see them all here. And remember, you probably see them again in Stranger of Paradise, so make sure to say hi. 
Stilva from Final Fantasy VII. One random encounter that you can get during this dungeon is this beautiful red monster called Stilva. His design is very familiar as it shares that and the name of the Final Fantasy VII monster that you encounter at Gaia's Cliff, from who you can learn Magic Breath and Trine. Another monster that gives you Trine is the Materia Keeper, who as you can see, is the same enemy but blue. It's the original Silva, you may say. Death Case We made it into the final bosses, and Kucha decided to throw at you his new pet first, to test your power. This monster is called Death Case, and it shares its flying skeletal design and the affinity with death in general with the flying optional monster in Final Fantasy VI, Death Case. Their name is the same in Japanese. And yes, once more, from this game on, it became a common throwback enemy, appearing in Final Fantasy 1 and 4, the remastered versions, and in Final Fantasy 14. The Illusions of Necron and the Last Fight Defeating Kucha's trance state is not the final boss of Final Fantasy 9, as there's another surprise for you. After all the illusions through the game, one would expect that the last boss who appeared just now will have some link with previous games and it's a pretty interesting one. The relation between Kuja and Necron shares some interesting parallels with the end boss in Final Fantasy III. This is because after Garland confirmed that Kuja's mortality is close to an end, the fear of his own death and all the despair and hatred after he learned of his mortality, just when his ambitions were within reach, allows him to awaken the entity known as Necron to destroy all life and reduce everything into a state of nothingness. This made a very interesting parallel between Kuja and Final Fantasy III main antagonist Sande, originally comrade of Une and Doga, who was given the gift of mortality, which in the end drove him into madness. The imbalance he ended up provoking, motivated by that fear of death, is what allowed the true final boss of Final Fantasy III, the Cloud of Darkness, to appear, an entity who decides to return everything into nothingness, making this connection between the bosses a real cool one. And if we make a quick recap, during the game we can relate Final Fantasy IX main antagonist Kuja to a number of iconic antagonists in the franchise, as we can see the Golbez parallel at the beginning working on the shadows, how he defied his master and killed him mercilessly like Kepka, and in the end how his ambitions and madness create a similar final boss like Sande, making him even a cooler character in my eye personally. There are a few more things about this fight to compare. The start of it is one which can remind you of how the last battle of Final Fantasy IV happened, with your party knocked down, while the rest that you don't use in the actual fight will call for you and give you that sweet full HP that will surely need. And the last thing is a more straightforward one, as Necron has an attack called Grand Cross, who annoyingly will cast a number of status effects on you, so good luck with that part. This same attack, with the same name, is one that the final boss of Final Fantasy V Neo X Death will cast to you, because why wouldn't they do that, right? Cloud and Squall To end things in a lighter tone, and with a less convoluted reference, the epilogue of Final Fantasy IX take us back to the theater play I Want to Be Your Canary, where Marcus has the iconic line No cloud, no squall shall hinder us. He's talking of the weather, of course, but as we all know, this is a reference to the other PlayStation Final Fantasy protagonist, Cloud Strife and Squall Lionheart. The funny part about this is that this is only in the English translation, but given the nature of this game, I think it fits perfectly as it is. We have reached the end of this amazing game, and with that, some clarifications. I'm sure that these are not all the references that exist in this game, some of them are maybe too small details to be included, like the mention of an opera house, the aircrafts with the number 8 like the Delling cars in Final Fantasy VIII, or an NPC called the Flower Girl, just like how Aerith was labeled as. And also, there's a tons of more callbacks and easter eggs about other games in, in, from Square, like Chrono Trigger, Parasite Eve, um, Final Fantasy Tactics for sure, but I'm just focusing on the mainline games here. Also real-life references, religious one, in Oilbert there's a, a very known logo that I haven't talked about, of course, but it's, it's really cool if you want to look it up. I hope you enjoyed this recap and made you appreciate the game even more, given how much love and respect was put into the making of it. 
and that's all we can ask for from any developer, and we are very grateful when that's the case. Another thing that I think it's worth to clarify is that no matter how many throwbacks this game may have, it still has its own main story and characters with their own arcs that makes it unique. That's how it's such an enjoyable game still, even if you have no idea about any of the Final Fantasy or the franchise in general, and I think making that balance between some illusions and its own individuality worked out perfectly. Shout out to the Final Fantasy wiki by the way. I enjoy visiting it to learn more about the franchise, it's a nice rabbit hole to, to fell into. It has a nice complete archive. And to check that comes walkthrough about Final Fantasy IX, there's a, another one from Final Fantasy XII, really cool. It helped me to follow this game in record time so I can get the footage. So yeah, it saved me quite a couple of times. So yeah, take care, go play some Final Fantasy, I think it's pretty neat. I will make sure to do that as I try to stream my Final Fantasy Marathon personally. I'm currently dying constantly on Final Fantasy XIII on my Twitch channel, uh, but I really love it. Of course, if you like the video, any type of support is more than appreciated. I will try to do more of this. I'm thinking about something related to Final Fantasy XII, which is kinda overlooked in my opinion, and I really love it because there, there are some neat details that are also kind of callbacks or just little easter eggs of previous games, especially with the hunts and all of that. So yeah, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoy. Love you!